this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. So once a year, you go to the doctor, right? They take your blood pressure. Maybe they prick your finger and they take a little blood and they give you a sense of your cholesterol level. Maybe if you go to one of those fancy healthcare facilities, they get you to run on a treadmill for a while, see how your heart's doing. You get a checkup. The same thing should be true of your business. When we look at your business through the Value Builder score, we're going to look at it through eight key drivers that acquirers care about. Whether you want to sell your business immediately or in 10, 20 years from now, these are the eight factors that business buyers care about. Knowing them now will help you maximize the value of your business going forward. Just go to valuebuilder.com and take the questionnaire. If you've listened to the show for a while, you know that I'm often cautioning you about private equity groups and corporate buyers, and you may think it's a little bit overhyped, but my next guest will hopefully disabuse you of that fact. He will describe the acquisition of his company, Skyward, by Verizon. Now, in the end, it worked out great for both parties, and I think it's a fantastic acquisition story. But my favorite part was when Jonathan got into the description of the corporate development executives at Verizon and how different they are from the venture capital arm of the business that originally invested in his company. Skyward is an amazing company. Think of it as a business designed to control the chaos in the skies as drones become more and more popular. Everyone from Amazon to Walmart are now using drones in some way, shape, or form, but that's creating a lot of chaos above us. And Jonathan Evans' idea was to create some software that would sort of regulate that, create some digital train tracks uh, in the sky that would enable companies to deal with drones safely. He will tell you an amazing story of how he launched the company and how he ultimately got acquired by Verizon. I think you'll find it interesting. Here to tell you the rest is Jonathan Evans. Jonathan Evans, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Thanks, John. It's good to be here. You are in a tent in the middle of nowhere. So, okay, so let me set the stage here. Uh, I know a lot of you are going to be listening to this on uh, an audio device, but I happen to be doing this live with Jonathan uh, on YouTube. And so I'm looking at him, and he's kind of wearing a, like a cool shirt. He's in the background. There's a mountain range, and it looks like he's in a tent. So, John, <laughs> what gives? Where on earth are you? Yes, yeah, it's a tent called the Lotus Bell, which is sort of like a simple yurt almost. And I'm on a platform and everything. And yeah, one of my my dreams was always to get some acreage property out in the Columbia River Gorge and and build my own little homestead. So, uh, I started doing that. Uh, well, in about in about February March, which you might remember, another big thing happened. I, I swear I didn't I didn't come out here to uh, you know bury myself in a hole because of the pandemic. I was <laughs> these were my designs for a while, and now I'm living like the dream a- and building a house out here. And this is a perfectly good summer summer quarters. So. Wow. Yeah. It's like the, the built-in social distancing. It's perfect. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's a, I can't think of, um, of a cleaner, finer, more beautiful place to be. And, um, you know, as, as tragic as the global pandemic is, we're all trying to make it through with a few glances at beauty, I think, and, and, and uh, improve our lives. And that's what we're doing out here. Yeah. Well, if you get a chance, hop on YouTube and, and check out Jonathan's setup. It's a cool setup. It's going to make you incredibly jealous if you live in a big city uh, right now. But it's all made possible, I guess, because of Skyward. So tell me about this company. Um, how did it come about? What, what did you guys do? Yeah. So I, uh, Skyward is a, you know, was a, is a drone operations management software platform. And I come to that sort of geeky aviation project, if you will, uh, originally as a professional aviator. Um, I started my professional flying career in the army in, I guess, 1997. And, um, and I flew Blackhawks in the army for about nine years and, uh, mainly like to fly ambulances, uh, whenever I could get that assignment. And I did that 
as well as a civilian uh, for a little while. I flew all over the West and, and then up in Alaska for a while. And, um, and then I, I took a job down in Oregon, uh, Eugene, Oregon, uh, flying an ambulance again. I, I kind of like, like that job. Um, what is it about and, that job uh, that, that you like? Oh, I mean, we're the best part of people's worst day. You know, like if you're, if you're getting picked up by a helicopter, it's definitely gonna be a story for the rest of your life. And, um, you know, I just, I, I always wanted to have some, I, I just love flying first and foremost. And I, I think at, from an early age, I wanted to find some real purpose in it. Um, not just to sort of enjoy <laughs> the sensation of wiggling the sticks and <laughs> moving around in three dimensional, four dimensional space, uh, space and time there, however you want. I mean, there is a lot of freedom and enjoyment in it, but I, I, there is something about flying an ambulance that has a lot of purpose and meaning. And like I say, uh, you know, con- connect with people in, in ways that, that you wouldn't normally get to it. So uh, were you super smart in school? Like, did you do well in science and that kind of subject? Hmm. Um, well, so I have a kind of a mixed, uh, I guess I have a mixed track record with school. I was a solid B student, um, because I, uh, you know, I kind of didn't like doing my homework. I was, I was busy building things and creating things and rallying my groups of friends around any other project than school. And, um, but you know, I, uh, I was always in, in the right classes to sort of track towards college and, um, I had very, very smart. I, I, I'll tell you what I realized in, uh, in those, in those honors and AP classes, how unsmart I was compared to the people that were in them. Um, and some of my best and dear friends uh, in life, uh, sort of taught me that humility early, but no, I mean, I, I, I just have, I think an intellectual curiosity and, um, and I have a, a drive towards creativity uh, around, especially building complex things. I like, like when I was in fifth grade, I probably rallied kids around building a fort that was way out of our capabilities. Um, but I just kind of had that drive and I, I still do. So that's really cool. Got it. So how does it go from flying people, really sick people in helicopters to owning a business? What's give me the transition there. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of downtime, honestly, in flying an ambulance, any kind of first responder life is, um, you know, it's probably marked more by the, the time in between than these sort of adrenaline soaked uh, moments that it affords. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm, like you said, as a geeky pilot, the, the military not only trained me to fly helicopters, it also trained me as a network administrator. And so I was, you know, I was surfing. I always say I surfed to, to I got to the bottom of the internet on certain subjects and, and just scraped the bottom and be like, that's, that's all anybody knows about that. And I felt like I kind of did that with drones uh, while I was on duty and, um, and drones really struck me as, you know, I could see them very, very directly, I guess, a, a path to them becoming a network of fly, flying aerial robots, um, sort of like a network of IoT that could move around in space, right? IoT, and, you use that term that won't be familiar with everybody. Can you define IoT? Yeah, Internet of Things. And, and that's sort of just a little foreshadowing of what, you know, Verizon saw in us, for sure, from the outset is... They, you know, there's a whole new generation of, you know, 5G technologies and others that are joining the Verizon and other LT networks that are, you know, not just these, these supercomputers that we hold, you know, ubiquitously in our hands and connect us to all other connected people in the world, which is quite a feat. Um, we're attaching more and more things to the internet and this sort of third wave of the internet at a, at a civilization level, at an infrastructure level. So, um, you know, smart meters for your home tied to the internet in a very passive, low, low energy way at the edge. Um, and uh, is, is a great example of one. Um, sensors and refrigeration at commercial and industrial levels, sensors for um, all of the, uh, the road infrastructure and traffic flows, right? These things are all getting tied into the internet. And that's sort of what's described broadly as the internet of things. Okay. And drones as a technology are a perfect sort of mobile dynamic node moving in sort of the great blue space of, of the sky on a very broad view of the internet of things. And I think that's what I could see sort of from the grounds up as a, as an analog, um, you know, helicopter pilot, I used to say, you know, sort of, uh, uh, a soft, a soft, the wet, wet software autopilot and like flesh servo auto, you know, drone basically is what I was. And I could see how, if you could take all of the rules of the road, I understood as that analog sort of cog in the wheel of this great aviation machine and collapse that into software, then you would truly have a conduit to take these new robotic aircraft into the sky 
and there's only one missing piece. They have to be ubiquitously connected to the internet. Hence the nice marriage with Verizon, <laughs> the, the nation's largest network. Okay. So let's get to that in a moment, just so I understand it. So, so drones, so I know commercial airplanes, uh, my late father-in-law was a pilot. And so he told me that planes flying eastward are all at like 30, the, the, at the odd number, 1,000 feet, 33,000, 35,000. And then westward, it's the opposite or whatever. I can't remember which one is which. But that keeps the planes from heading, like kind of hitting each other head on, right? Because all the mm-hmm. ones going the same direction are 1,000 feet above or below anything going the other direction. So your idea was to take those sort of lanes in the mm-hmm. sky and mm-hmm. apply it to drones? Mm-hmm. And you just, you just described what's called the semicircular rule. And it, I'll just sum it up real quickly for you that if you're heading easterly, then you want to fly on the odd altitudes. And if you're heading westerly, you fly on the, the e- even altitudes. Um, that's sort of the first risk mitigation strategy of, of um, like federated self aviation uh, airspace management, which is, has been most of aviation's history, right? That at the edge, we have rules of the road just that we inherited a lot from maritime, honestly, to sort of break right if we're heading towards each other. And those rules get ensconced and evolve from there. And eventually we have other risk mitigations in centralized air traffic control facilities that are also able to control us and see us in space and mitigate the risk of any kinds of collisions. If you look at the order of magnitude or two or possibly even three more aircraft in the sky that drones represent, that these networks of flying robots represent, it's clear that you need to go to a risk mitigation and airspace management strategy at the edge, federated again, that the nodes in space are able to follow the rules of the road autonomously and mitigate them against other nodes that are in space. And so there's a there's a common framework that has to sort of emulate the tech stacks that we see in both the internet and in really the mobile networks and how they do handoffs of, of, of control of these, of these small, of these small supercomputers in our hands. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. Yeah, cause, Cause Jeff Bezos is threatening to like fly us all toilet paper in a drone to every house in the world. So eventually we're going to yeah. have these drones all over the place. Yeah. Oh yeah, the, once we cross the threshold in, in the regulatory art of what's called beyond visual line of sight operation of the drone, which, which we haven't crossed yet, um, but we're, we're really on the cusp of it. That, that really means that today a drone can be flown from the pilot being on the ground within visual line of sight of the aircraft that she's controlling, right? And the, all the risk mitigation is about her visual capability to, to, to separate it from other aircraft that might be in the area and also the area that she's allowed to be flying and is quite mitigated by the FAA as well. And so that's the current sort of state of regulatory art that we're allowed to operate these technologies in. Doesn't really allow for the sort of network view that I have of, of the aerial robot flying as this network of IOT. Um, to get beyond visual line of sight, we have to be able to trust a whole lot of things from an aviation perspective, including the connectivity to the drone is going to be there if it's going to receive any kind of strategic or even tactical signaling about where it is to move in space. And we haven't yet certified a network like Verizon's to the FAA's satisfaction to an aircraft that is also airworthy in every other way at the edge as well. But that tech stack is starting to add up and I'm, I'm grateful to see the project that I started in Skyward continue to live and thrive at Verizon as a growing division there that's going after that, that certified FAA tech stack now. Just as an aside, you sound way smarter than a B student. <laughs> Just as an aside, I think that's a total <laughs> load it's of a matter, whatever. It's probably a matter of <laughs> investment of effort, I think. Is, which, which games right. do you want to play? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so you're an ambulance driver, fl- a pilot. You're breaking the internet trying to figure out drones. How do you go from that to co- creating a company? Like, I'm imagining this is, massive amounts of capital to create a software company that's going to do all this. Like how did, what was the next step? Well, we actually, you know, we walked a very, uh, a path that could be well satirized, I think by Silicon Valley, HBO Silicon Valley. If you've, yeah. if you've seen that, I mean, we were West coast company, Portland, Oregon. So not, not exactly San Francisco or the Bay area, which is, but kind of a bedroom community to it as technologists. Um, and, and only an hour and a half flight away. So we, we did walk Sand Hill road and, um, brought this idea, this this idea again that you know I was I was sort of walking in the room to say, look, I I am a geeky pilot. I, I I understand aviation really well, and I can see how you can collapse this into software. I'm I'm not a, a software programmer. I'm not an engineer, but I you know I speak geek enough to always riff with them, 
Um, and I always have. And, and, and so I could see sort of a clear path of intelligence of taking this very clear, um, you know, this rules of the road, this ontology of you know, this database that's well, you know, it's hundred years established uh, by the FAA and others around the world. And just bringing that into the information age, like just programming for that. Nobody had ever done that. And it seemed very, very clear that if you could do that and take all the rules, you know, I know as a helicopter pilot moving around in the same regulated airspace and program for it, then these aircraft could just start to move around on that software program, right? And that was always the thesis. That was always the idea. It took a lot of unpacking and explaining of how the regulations work in aviation. But, you know, venture capitalists eventually believed me that there, there was a path here. And for what it's worth, uh, this isn't all a hero's tale. You know, I, I wasn't right, um, you know, in, in terms of the timing. The, the story that I told was not right. It, you know, in 2012, I started that journey. We ended up raising $8 million over about five years uh, through a few rounds of capital. Um, and when I started telling that story in 2012, 2013 on Sand Hill Road and others, um, you know, I, I saw this industrial revolution really taking place within about five years and that threshold being crossed and all of this sort of industrial ecosystem and tech stack coming together to make it happen that seemed the art of the possible to me. And for multiple reasons, it hasn't. Um, I think probably it's an easy thing to say regulatory, you know, inertia, but I don't like to beat that up too much because that's also the same, you know, institution of safety we trust when we walk down a jetway. And, and I think that's pretty sacred. So if it takes longer than I anticipated as an evangelical at the beginning of this industrial revolution, then that, that's okay, as long as it arrives to improve on the standards of safety we have in the aviation system today. But, you know, I wasn't right. Like the the, the full wave hasn't taken place yet. I would actually say that um, we sold at the top of what you call the, the hype cycle. And I don't know if your listeners are f familiar with that, but you know, and the adoption curves of any technology, there's this first hump that <laughs> the top of what you call a hype cycle. Uh, and I think for commercial use of drones, industrial use of drones, you know, we're still the only software company to, to exit to, you know, Fortune 500 company. And I think we, we did that at the top of the hype, hype cycle. And gratefully, the project has now been incubated, basically, from Verizon, what you'd call patient money, from, you know, 2017 on, and has actually been invested in, in that patient money. And I think the, the industry and the project of Skyward have actually arrived now through the trough of disillusionment and are coming into industrial adoption right now. And Verizon is shepherding that in with, with Skyward being a subsidiary. Got it. Got it. You're, you're, you're referring to Clayton Christensen's like the, I can't remember what the crossing the chasm was that, is that the, the book yeah. you're referring to? Yeah. Worth, yep. worth a read for sure. It's been a while since I've read it, but, but I remember it resonating when I did. Um, and so you lived that, that, yeah. that curve. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we were lucky to, I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to say like, Oh, look at me. So smart. I sold the company. <laughs> I hyped up a company and sold it at the top of the cycle. By any means, please don't take it as that. Um, I was very, very fortunate that that was the timing of all of these, you know, nuanced dances that take place in the, in the startup cycle for sure. And that's, like, would, that's, I know your whole the thesis and world to look at. It. Yeah. Yeah. How, yeah. How, so do, what, how do you approach these junctions? You know? Yeah. 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 So what was the original business model? So I get the product vision, uh, but I'm curious to know what you envisioned to be the way you were going to make money. Well, we, we did start making money and this is a lot of our, you know, legitimate traction in the early marketplace that didn't have the full rising tide of industrial adoption behind it. We did have all the early adopters. We had a book of business that included a lot of fortune 500 companies um, that were doing the first early adopter use cases of drones in media, of drones in construction, of drones in telecom tower inspections, of drones in um, utility work, right? And, and so those companies so that, were buying your software to manage their fleet of drones? You got it. Okay. We were, we were a SaaS product for the most of our lives, the vision always being to converge on this collapsed vision of a, what, what the telcos would call an OTT and, and on the top network. So it's a software defined network on top of sort of ubiquitous in, industrial grade infrastructure as connectivity. OTTs have also been kind of the enemy of telcos, Netflix, Amazon, <laughs> Google, uh, the whole net neutrality debate comes from, from that, right? That, well, they're getting all the value of like using our pipes kind of, kind of debate, right? 
Um, and, and so a Verizon looks to build and not kind of not get their ass kicked in the next generation, right. Of, of this third wave of the internet. And that's why they look to buy a company like ours is because we, we can become that OTT to manage aircraft and regulated airspaces on their network. And that's a really nice marriage. And, I mean, you must, I mean, like you're an air <laughs> helicopter pilot. At some point you must have brought some people together that know how to run a software company. No? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, no, absolutely. From the outset. I mean, when I uh, was invested in the first major investor that came in institutional investor, you'd say, you know, VC was Voyager capital based out of Seattle. Um, okay. And, and they, you know, gratefully introduced me to probably one of the most important um, partners in, in the whole team along the journey, uh, Mariah Scott. And, and this is a classic sort of VC thing to do. You're just a helicopter pilot with a lot of zany <laughs> ideas and, you know, was a B student. And, it and keeps dropping out of school. By the way, I dropped out of college and then I dropped out of an MBA. To, to <laughs> why do I, start why did I, too. why did I know that in advance? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So you're, you're me, living you know, B student. <laughs> you know, they're, so they look at me and they, and they're like, okay, good. We got, you know, the, the stem of the T, if you will. Okay. Now we need to kind of up level that, that passion and that, you know, that vision intelligence to, to scale at the top of the T. And um, that's a lot of what a VC represents in, in, in investing in your company, not just the dollars, but actually bringing a level of sophistication to maybe a deep intelligence, passion idea uh, that needs it to actually reach some kind of a scale and sophistication and that you can, you know, not only sell the product to a Verizon, an NBC, a, a DPR construction, but also sell the whole company to a Verizon, right? So there, there's a whole lot that you go from uh, you know, that nascent clay of, you know, wanting to be an entrepreneur to, to coming through, I think that first institutional investment and learning how to make a real company. Um, and one of the best things that they tend to do, and they did with me very successfully is introduce you to somebody that's got that corporate sophistication and has a deep background in, 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 in scaling a company, you know, in the corporate world um, to marry up with basically my intelligence about aviation. And that was Mariah Scott. She, she had 16 years at Intel. She ran Intel inside for a few years. Um, she was a fantastic partner to me. She came in as my COO after basically the first investment by Voyager. And we walked the trail ever since. And she is now, uh, after we sold the company in February, 2017 to Verizon, she became my co-president, uh, of that division. And we, we kind of made official what was always a very plural relationship as CEO and COO. Um, and, and then when I finally made my transition last fall, uh, end of last summer, um, I was very confident doing that because I'd spent the last year handing off the full reins to Mariah. And now she's the president of the subsidiary. So that, that, that worked really nicely. What did that feel like, uh, to, to have the VC who is now a fairly influential person in your, in your organization, in your life where you you've, you've kind of tied yourself to them bringing in their own sort of person, if you will, not an employee, but someone they, they, you know, they, they knew of. I'm guessing at some point that may have felt like, wait a minute, I'm losing control of my baby here. Like all mm. these people are sort of driving the bus now. Did mm. you go through any of those emotions or what was, what was that like? Oh yeah. 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 Very empathetic, John. That's, that's, that's exactly dead on. I mean, there's also this well-documented notion of the imposter syndrome that I was living through as well. Like you, you just said it, you're into just a helicopter pilot. <laughs> well, how, how did you figure out how to build the software, right? And that's the, kind of the way I felt every time I walked into a VC's office, even though I maybe didn't look that way. Um, and that's, that's well-documented. People have talked about that many times. I'm happy to say I lived through it and, uh, and had many ways that I kind of grew through it. I can, you know, happy to... Um, unpack a little, but the, the answer to your question is, yeah, I mean, it took me a little bit of time to build trust with Mariah. And, and I had a question about, was she here to like, because the VCs are judging me as, you know, you know, maybe not being good enough. And quite frankly, at, at times they were, I mean, we, we had some very contentious moments with our own board as, as the journey went on and we had trouble raising money at times. And it looked like, you know, thing might die on the vine, like a lot of a lot of tech startups do, VC backed tech startups do. Um, and there's talk about, you know, removing me and trying to find somebody else to lead this thing. And gratefully, you know, is turning that corner where I sat next to Mariah and she, you know, she kind of sits at, as the heavy, the real heavy at the table and goes, well, I'm not working for a company he's not the CEO of. 
And I realized, oh, okay. I, like it was all, there was really a Hollywood moment where I, all of, all of the insecurity you just asked about was like dissolved. And, and I realized, and that was probably our, maybe a year into our working together where it was a little like, oh God, I don't know what I'm doing. And she really does, but am I going to still get to do anything? If You know, like there was a lot of insecurity there for sure. Um, but we continued to work well together in that year and build something real. And then to come to sort of a, a, a gut check real moment in a, in a sort of, you know, a, an emotional moment with the board and, and to have her be very clearly, like just all of a sudden transparently, you know, my partner, my business partner in it and, and, and saying that I wouldn't work for a company that you weren't the CEO of, you know, that, that, that galvanized our relationship. And then we spent, you know, the next three years, four years, raising capital, building the company, and then ultimately selling it to Verizon. And now she continues to, like I say, lead a, a growing, th thriving project. When we were bought, I think we had 25 folks in Portland, Oregon. And I think she, last time I checked in with Mariah, she said they're at about 125 now. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. How does that feel to be the father of, there'll be like a footnote in history, the drone guy. Uh, How's that feel? Was, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I guess I try not to think about it that, that way too much. I, I enjoy the journey very much. I'll say it's been a real honor to get to do these things. I, um, it, it, it's, it, to, I always had this, fervency even in high school that I wanted to do something big I knew that and it's kind of why I dropped out of college and joined the army and kind of went to war flying helicopters I figured that's big but that's sort of a young man's foolishness uh and I and I learned that by going to Kosovo and flying an ambulance there and going god that was a stupid thing to think was a you know big um and then you know as I continued to kind of be on my journey in flying and, and doing very sort of entrepreneurial ideas and trying different things. I kept that fervency. And, I, and, and at some point I thought aviation's where I want to do it. It's very clear. Like I've spent, since I was 19 years old in uniform, I've spent my journey um, flying. And I, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty geeky about it. I love the technology too. And I love the, like as a network administrator, I could see that like basically aviation had skipped the internet. And I was like, oh, we should, there's something I could work on, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so that's kind of where it came from. Is I, I didn't kind of just want to keep flying the ambulance. You know, I wanted to be part of a bigger system. And drones definitely seemed like a catalyst to that ambition. And I kind of took it. And if you look at what I'm doing now, I've started my next company. It's called Connect Air. And, you know, we're building an on-demand flexible flight network available to all of us in our phones like we're used to in Lyft. And... Oh, cool. It's sort of the ulti ultimate, it's sort of the ultimate, you know, it's a culmination of my journey in that, you know, I spent time in the ultimate on-demand aviation <laughs> charter system in that ambulance, you know, under very acute conditions, we'll say, you know, moving towards people's very acute demands. Um, and, and I kind of saw that a, a very proto, really analog driven system could, could, could run with sort of brute force of Medicare and Medicaid and insurance companies behind it. Um, and you could build an entire national network that way. And I saw that 10 years ago. Um, now that I've been through the journey of building a software company and now I've been, in, you know, a vice president at Verizon even for, for a year or so, um, I, I kind of have seen, the, again, the sort of full stack, right, of how, how that all works and what I was looking at from the bottoms up as a helicopter pilot. And now I'm like, okay, I'm going to provide a flexible on-demand software to find flight network to real paying customers and you know, real butts and seats, we say, um, on crude aviation, C-R-E-W-E-D, and also some might argue spelled the other way, but crude aviation and real airplanes. And, um, and that's, it, but apply all of these sort of software lessons because one of the hardest parts about the drone industry and that, that hype cycle I was talking about, we lived that the whole time. We were pushing a rope uphill. We kept saying there's going to be a market for this service. And we kept, you know, building in, in you know, a, a small but growing and anemic flywheel by sort of enterprise standards of revenues proving that there was some pull on that rope, just a little pull on the rope, but not industrial scale, not Verizon scale. It's going to take still years to get to enough connected devices to make this bet worth it, if you will. I want to get into how Verizon kind of came into the picture. And then I want to end off with more talk about Connect Air. Before we go to Connect Air, though, just back up to Verizon. So the first round of investment were professional investors, venture capitalists and so forth. At what point did, was it, I'm assuming it was the kind of ventures arm of a Verizon that invested originally? That's right. 
Yeah, okay. in our second round. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's sort of like, uh, as I understand it, like big companies will have this sort of VC arm where they're trying to get in early on cool ideas. That's right. And and so they they invested as part of the eight million dollar raise over time. Well, eight, it was a total of eight million dollars. I think it was one point five was first round, four point one was second. Uh, we had a bridge note, a bridge to the middle of the lake, you call it. Uh, and, uh, and What and is a raised... bridge to the middle of the lake? I have no idea what that is. Well, we were running out of money and we hadn't raised our next round. We were perpetually <laughs> trying to raise this Series A. We ended up calling it uh, Seed 1, Seed 2. We ended up actually having a $10 million Series A raised uh, with Sony and uh, Techstars Ventures was leading it. The Yamaha Ventures was running. We were, we were having two more uh, what you call strategic VCs. So Verizon's a strategic VC as opposed to a financial VC. Um, we, we, had, we had built another syndicate for a series A of 10 million. We literally had to, when we took the acquisition, we had to shut that down. We had to shut down wiring of funds almost um, with one of our VCs on that $10 million round. So anyway, we, we raised, you know, we were constantly trying to raise money because again, there's no real pull on the rope. There's no real revenue growth. There's no, you know, it's still this loss leader to a future that, you know, we and the, the VCs that invest in us believe in uh, that sort of that cliche, almost hockey stick in the future that you get to burn capital towards <laughs> in the, in the Silicon Valley mo- model. Um, and we kept doing that and we kept having to sort of burn capital to kind of get to a future that again, that rising tide at an industrial scale has still not risen. So I was wrong, right? Like I, I, I was, I, I always like to underline that point. It will, it will, it's coming right now. I think actually anybody interested in, the space. If, if you're going to make a move, I'd, I'd, I'd be looking at industrial drone plays right now. The, the rising tide's coming under it's, for it's sure. Really coming. Yeah. So yeah. What are you, what kind of valuations are you raising? Because I'm assuming it's, it's some astronomical multiple of revenue. Oh, it's not. Yeah. You don't even do that. You, you can't even do that okay. at this stage in these sort of inception companies because that wouldn't, it would, it would look obtuse. Right. When I, and I look at the portfolio of what you, you, you usually talk about, John, it's, it's, it, it's almost always in that kind of a paradigm, right? And it yeah. makes sense, right? Net present value of, of future revenues. It's how you buy a stock of any kind, right? So, yeah. um, but in this world, it's really about this sort of inception zero to one bet. And, you know, the Verizon acquiring us is trying to buy basically a kernel of intelligence to insert into a, a scaled network. You know, and I, that's one of the most audacious things there is to do. It's one thing to raise capital in Silicon Valley. It's another thing to sell your company to, you know, Fortune 500 company. Those, those are great, wonderful, life-changing things in, in my life for sure. I'm, I'm not trying to poo-poo them at all. But the thing I'm proudest of, honestly, is what you just said, is what's it like to be the father of the thing, to, to see it continue thriving, to see it, I think Mariah is leading an effort to actually solve the innovator's dilemma. And I think that, you know, Verizon will actually scale that kernel of intelligence that, you know, a couple of really smart folks at Verizon were smart enough to see and go, oh, we could do something with that. And we shared that on our side. We said, yeah, if we could take what we're doing here in Portland and we could actually marry it up to the nation's largest LTE network, we could do something significant. And they are. I, I, I say they now I have to, that, that is a little, I will say a little bit of a pang, but I, you know, I say they now they are, they are doing it. So, yeah, you got to let your kids go off and, and be what they will at, in the, That's in the right. world. So That's right. how did the conversation with Verizon go from happy venture capitalists to no, no, we want to acquire you. Yeah. That was actually a pretty good story. Um, and so Dave Famolari is probably, you know, he's one of my best, um, investors I had. He wasn't a, f- a fiduciary board member because usually um, these strategic VCs won't do that because of conflicts of interest. Um, but he was an observer on our board and he was a regular advisor to us. And he's the one who had shared the vision at Verizon with us that we could, we could do something here. So Dave and, works at Verizon? Yeah, he was the venture arm you're talking about. He was the okay. partner in the venture arm that, you know, we met in, D- and we met in New York for the first time when we were on the trail. And, you know, he ended up investing in that second round and, and was with us all the way through. Um, and just a great advisor, really intelligent, kind human being. I have to say it's not necessarily always a modality you get in the VC world. <laughs> um, and, and, and just a really, uh, insightful, intelligent, um, kindness to, to our business. Definitely. And, and his, I think he, he certainly shared a vision and an ownership of what we we're doing and, and, and recognized the big picture would be nest the set Verizon, you know? 
Um, so we uh, were on a trail as usual. I think we're at a conference and um, I get randomly kind of pinged by uh, Corn Ferry. If you know who Corn Ferry is, they're sort of yeah. an international executive recruiting firm. And I, I don't know who they are. I'm, again, I'm still in the headspace of, I'm just this helicopter pilot getting lucky with Silicon Valley right now. Um, and, Corn Ferry is the uh, sort of the, the, the most prestigious recruiting firm. Like if IBM wants to hire a, a new CEO, they, they use Corn Ferry to do that, right? That's right. Yeah, I guess I learned, I end up learning this, uh, but I, I, they, they kind of reach out to me and say that um, they're reaching on, on behalf of Airbus and, um, mm. and that there's, and that would I be happy to talk to them? And I, I said, sure. I'd be, cause I was more curious about what Airbus is interested in, in drones more than anything. Cause I hadn't really heard them there yet. And Airbus is a really so, big player in aerospace. Did they think, of did you think that Airbus was interested in hiring you as an employee or acquiring your company? I didn't know, you know, I just, I, I literally didn't know that Corn Ferry was what you just described. Mariah asks me when she sees it on my calendar, she goes, oh, no. why, why are you talking to an executive recruiter? And I go, what are you talking about? She goes, Corn Ferry. And I like, oh, that's an exact, I don't know. They said that they wanted to talk to me about Airbus. About that's awesome. Airbus. She's probably thinking yeah. you're hiring a new COO. Yeah, exactly. Everybody's getting all paranoid. You know? like, I don't yeah. know. I'm just naive. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I take the call, and it turns out it's a guy that actually sits on the board of Airbus. He's a, like a captive recruiter, basically for the board of Airbus. And it was a, yeah, it was a it was a big no shit offer of sorts to to start developing the relationship towards. They asked me would I like to start a new Envision division of Airbus in drones, and I said no, I'd like to keep running Skyward. And I and I countered, would you be interested in acquiring my very small startup of I think we were fifteen people at the time to be the beginning of that division. And they said, we would be interested in that. And I said, then we can talk. And so that was the first phone call. Um, we, uh, we followed up with an email saying that we'll be coming to Munich soon to meet the CEO, right? That that was going to be, that was going to be the next talk was to meet the CEO of Airbus. And I was like, okay, that's, this sounds pretty real. Um, and so, you know, we got on the phone pretty quickly with Dave uh, Famolari again from Verizon, who's on our board and kind of just briefing him on this great, lucky out of nowhere news that it looks like, you know, we might have the beginnings of an acquisition sniff going here. And this is early. We didn't think this, I mean, it didn't feel like that way. we were in the hopper for acquisition and anything like that. Right. Um, and you can see it's an aqua hire kind of paradigm. They're trying to, you know, these companies are trying to grab really smart teams at sort of dawn of the drone industry. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't, we got off the phone with Dave, just giving him that quick update. Uh, I think it was within an hour or a couple hours that I, my inbox was blowing up from corp dev of Verizon. And I got on the phone with them and it was, it was right there. I'm, I've been instructed by uh, senior vice president, Mike Landman to make you an offer for acquisition of your company. Jonathan, are you interested? And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like held the phone away from my face kind of thing. Um, and I thought I better get off the phone because I'm a terrible zero sum negotiator. <laughs> I'm just not, I am just not that kind of a leader. I don't, I don't have a, a sort of brass tack in me. I don't think. And, uh, and I knew that it, this was, this is legit. So yeah. Um, entertained the offer. I gotta be honest at first, I kind of had a brash one of thought, you know, there's probably not a number big enough because I, I'm, I was really enthused about the project still growing and, and we had this series a, and we were going to get to keep doing it. And I thought, let's keep doing it. Um, but again, retrospect, very clearly, I'm glad I got over that in about, you know, a few days a week or whatever. Um, because uh, yeah, we sold, I think at the top dollar we possibly could have for our project. Um, and, and then got to inherit a, a fantastic sponsor of the project in Verizon that not only can make it real at the infrastructure level of the network, but could also continue to invest millions of dollars into the growth of that division and actually build real real nodes in space, you know? So, and that's what it's doing now. And it's, it's really, that's, that's the coolest part so far. So as you're thinking about what your number is and you're talking to the Airbus guys, did, did they get to the, the point of actually putting a number in front of you? No, they weren't close to that. It was, it was really okay. just the, are you interested in meeting and starting to talk at the C-suite level about this, which was, that's a strong, that's strong. You don't get that out of nowhere either. Um, but we weren't anywhere close to the acquisition, like term sheet level. Clearly when I had the first conversation with Corp Dev at Verizon, they knew their number. They already knew it. It was loaded. 
they wanted to have a negotiation with me on the phone right then. And I was like, nope, I'm getting off. So there's a piece of advice for anybody. Don't negotiate the sale of your own company. I can't recommend that unless you're really good at that. Um, this is a great time to get a broker, <laughs> you know, at like, and those are called investment bankers. Um, and they kind of have re reputations as good and bad as VCs, but they're, uh, I had some great ones and they were super sophisticated and capable of handling that, those phone calls basically moving forward. So did they, okay. So the, the, I've got so many questions about this. So Verizon has a number in mind. Did they give that to you over the phone? I can't remember if they did that first time, but I remember knowing that I can't, I can't be the negotiator. I remember de deflecting away from negotiations on the phone. Did they try to pull your number out of you? What do you want for your business? Kind oh, of course. Idea? Their this guy's job. Think of, this is why I recommend going to an investment banker, which you, I say affectionately about my investment bankers are the most darling sharks that you could ever hire to get into that tank with this other shark, right? Because that's the thing. This guy's job every day for Verizon has nothing to do with a passion about or zeal about acquiring you know, this kernel of intelligence to scale for Verizon. That's the VP's job. That the VP that wanted to acquire us, that had to go to the CFO's house to get the money to do it, he's the passionate one right? He's the one that sees the vision. He's not allowed to negotiate with you either. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like they have a whole bureau there. Right? Like they do for everything in a company that has 150,000 people. You know, they have a whole division that's come almost sociopathically detached from the value that's trying to be achieved. Right? Like it's literally, I am a machine. I acquire other machines for the least amount of money I possibly can. And this guy's job is to do that every day. My job is to build value as an entrepreneurial CEO, right? And so all of a sudden I'm in a shark tank and I'm trying to build value. And they're like, no, it's a zero sum game. So um, I, was, I knew I was outclassed, outmatched by this negotiator for sure. And I, I was so grateful to grab, uh, you know, uh, Kamal over at, <laughs> at, at, at GCA to, to, to do the negotiations for us. Yeah, let's give Kamal a shout out. So when you say... <laughs> So how did they try to draw out the number for me? Like what questions did the, the corporate development people from Verizon ask you? So Jonathan, what would like, like what question would they ask to try to solicit the number from you? They didn't, they gave us an offer and we, and we, and we said, no, 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 that's way too low. You know, like you do. Like, <laughs> and then it was about more us. I think honestly, in this situation, I learned so here's where I can give hindsight and show what I didn't know behind the was behind the curtain. I learned that Kamal ended up maxing out what was available to the vice president's budget. Maxed it, maxed the budget. So the negotiation was sort of, but it was opaque to us that that was the ceiling. It started to feel like it, I'll say, because it was like, we can't seem to push them any further. Um, but it, it was, and we would have scuttled the deal to have pushed further. So I know that in retrospect, right? And, and meanwhile, it feels like it's negotiation tactics. Like right? when they're saying no to your higher number, you have to be willing to walk away if you want to keep getting a higher number. And that, that's one of the hardest moments in this whole thing, I think. I knew it because I was already over the emotional threshold that I didn't want to walk away from this. I did want this deal somewhere in this ballpark. You know, and now I don't want my own negotiator to drive my psychology too far into the negotiation space to threaten that, right? And there's a, there's a lot of dynamic psychology going on there. And that's ultimately what Kamal was really good at. The investment bankers are really good at is they're really good at behavioral psychology. And they're really good at reading basically through the, the corp dev officer what the body language really is about the value system behind them, right? And they're good at reading me and Mariah, she, she was a board member too. We were equal partners in this as well, making these decisions. Um, he, he was able to read in us where we were psychologically on the deal as well, and then navigate to the optimal value of the art of the possible, I think. And we're really talking, you know, marginal differences in the big picture. There was an order of magnitude in which, you know, that was gonna come in. We, we made three to five X for our investors, depending on when they came in. It was a very, it was a success. It'd probably be considered hitting a single or a double by most Silicon Valley standards. But I, I think 100% a year is pretty good return for most people, so. <laughs> um, Sounds great. You know, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, and, 
and yeah, I'm glad that I, again, my initial reaction was there isn't a number high enough. I, th- it's not about a number to me. It was, it's a life changing experience economically. So I don't want to, I don't want to poo poo that at all. Um, but, but really it's that the project can thrive, that it can live, that it can, it can soak up those new resources and become what I envisioned, I guess. That's the, did, that's the ticket. What took you from emotionally noncommittal, meaning eh, it's not enough, whatever. What, what actually took you to emotionally being, no, no, come on, don't screw this up. I want to get this deal done. What was the trigger that put you over that? Well, it was, I remembered it's, you, you're good. At, your, your questions are good, John. Um, Cause you hone in right to the interesting scenes in the story um, that, that I might forget. There was actually a moment. I remember a conversation where Mariah and I went into our conference room. It was just us. And so we're not evangelicals for the entire drone industry for a half a second. And like not saying the tide is rising, the tide is rising to our team, to journalists, to investors, to everybody, our entire lives for the last five years, right? We're always like the rise, the rise, the rise, the rise, the market's coming. Trust us. We're leading it. Um, We turned to each other and we said, is the market on the rise? And how, and, and how long is it taking? And we both said, no. And it was like the both, it was like both of us being vulnerable enough to admit to each other that everything mm. we've been saying, I'm, I'm not saying we were bullshitting. I really believed it. I really did. But when I had to have a gut check about, do we want to take a $10 million series A right now and try to keep pushing this rope uphill for 24 months? Or do we want to take, you know, five X on the earliest money and our investors right now and turn this project into an industrial project of Verizon in this market, like which, which vessel has viability. And it was very clear to us, get on the big fucking vessel. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 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 So how, how did Kamal discover what the upper limit of the, VP's budget was what like, there was some what clear hardness. He, he got the first, you know, he got the first couple million in like the first 15 minutes of a conversation. Right. Yeah, and it felt like, yeah. yeah. Like it's just like in the first negotiation, he got what he could, I think. I, I, I can't mm. remember the each iteration. It probably incremented up maybe two or three times, but it, it clearly hit a ceiling. Like it was the, the body line. It was getting to the point that, his advice to us was walk away, right? That's, that's the last card you have now. Just walk, right? So it was a good number. It returned money to our investors. And it, again, I had decided to get on the big vessel. It was, it was clear to take the project there because we we're going to go through a lot more open ocean here. Dave from... Verizon, the VC arm of Verizon, almost the way you described him almost sounded like, a, I don't want to be pejorative in saying this, but almost a mentor figure for you, a, a real, a, 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 at least a very good, close relationship. Sure. Yeah. Here he is. Now you're, he's sort of, in a way, arm's length as, as an adversary in this negotiation. Oh, not in a way. Back to that sort of, this is why <laughs> Kafka, this is why Kafka writes about bureaucracies because they all do this. They, they all shape themselves into detached realities, right? Just because of the nature of the sprawling nature of the beast, right? And so Dave, by rule of some kind, was immediately cut off from communication with us. He was like, we didn't get, again, we didn't get to interact with any of the people that loved us at Verizon as soon as we were interacting with Corp Dev. Right. And literally, I, I felt like towards the end of the hopper a couple of times, like they should bring some kindness back into this equation because it's <laughs> starting to get to be a hard red pill to swallow here, Big Red, right? Like you guys are being tenacious and mean and annoying and bureaucratic and Oh, 90 days of, you know, trying to get your company actually acquired by Inc. is another whole experience. And, and you can see foreshadowing of all the experiences we're going to have integrating the company there. It got to be a morale dimmer, we'll say. And yeah. uh, I would I would have liked to have been able to talk to Dave a little bit more as we started to say, hey, this is really happening. Let's do this. How, how has it impacted your relationship today? Like, where are you guys at today, you and Dave? 
Oh, um, we check in, I'd say probably like maybe once a quarter, we, we might check up, okay. you know, have, have a call or something, you know, he's still a VC. Uh, it turns out that when you're an exited entrepreneur, VCs just love to talk to you about <laughs> the other stuff they're looking at. And, and so the one, you know, I, you know, I have great, great relationships with all my VCs and I, I continue to stay in touch with them. And, um, I, I look at a lot of drone plays for them basically. Right. Um, and oh, Dave cool. is, yeah, Dave's over at Hearst Ventures now. And, you know, I, first when we started talking, I was like, I don't know anything about the media, Dave. And, you know, he's like, oh, no, no, we're, you know, Hearst Ventures is kind of like, we're like family office VC. They look at everything. He's got a really interesting AI portfolio. He's a really smart guy. Um, and he's, he's, got, he's got an eclectic view of technology for sure. So you were, you were able to salvage that relationship, even though it, 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 it got acrimonious in the negotiation, not with Dave, but with oh, his as soon as partners. We were, yeah. we were in the company. We were then <laughs> reunited again. We got to, you know, it was sort of like, oh, neat. Now we're all on the same team. And, you know, it was, yeah. But there was just this whole bureaucratic thing during the acquisition that, you know, there were a lot of little bureaucratic rules to follow for them, clearly, you know. Yeah, yeah. I got to be the brash West Coast, you know, long haired technology guy that gets to be like, I don't like all these rules. This is stupid. This is why you're buying me, you know. So I, 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 didn't, I, can't, I can't believe you lasted as a VP at Verizon for a year. Yeah. Well, I would have given you yeah. about a week. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was an individual contributor gig. It was a nice title to kind of establish the uh, industrial category, basically, after I'd handed off the reins of running the division entirely to Mariah, which she was doing most of the, the journey anyway. Um, you know, I, I then got to spend a year as an individual contributor as the, the VP of global aviation policy at Verizon. And I did a lot of basically sort of industrial diplomat work. I, I spent a lot of my time at NASA and at the UN and at like GSMA, which is the, okay. the folks that do Mobile World Congress and trying to get interoperable standards for these, these basically flying cell phones roaming around in regulated airspaces. And that I wanted, we wanted to use that title to really affect the industrial category to have Verizon really, you know, and establish it as a new industrial category. And, and that was sort of the last lap that I did in the project. And I was grateful for it. It was a great, it was a lot of fun to actually. That actually that sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about Connect, Connect Air, the new company. So you were saying the idea is to connect. Well, I won't do it. Explain it in layman's terms for folks who may not have heard of Connect Air. Yeah, so it's an, it's an on-demand flexible flight network, uh, you know, available to you, you know, all of us eventually. Um, and and we, we do the full T that I was referring to, right? We, we not only do all of the operational intelligence it takes to actually fly the most efficient and right-sized aircraft available in the market today, but we also are scaling that concept using software so that we can bring into our network aircraft that are geographically distributed and are able to affect a much more efficient on-demand system so that you're not flying empty legs with those aircraft using software. And, and so it's, it, the experience to you is going to be new because I bet, you know, maybe, maybe you have, John, but not too many people have been able to, you know, ever order a private chartered aircraft of any kind, usually a jet. Um, in this case, we're, we're using, like I said, right-sized, efficient uh, turboprop aircraft, so not jets, that actually bring the price of operations much more into the bell curve um, at, at, at the outset. And then again, affecting the efficiencies we can using software and how we dispatch them in time and space to, to customer demand and how we can generate demand uh, a la a sort of hotel tonight kind of uh, auction uh, on the empty legs, if you will. Um, you know, being able to do that offers this on demand, what we say personal air mobility to a whole new market that, That's that has so never really existed before. Yeah. And, and we're already seeing that we're already proving that. And, uh, and would, we're really would, just would, getting started. I've read a ton of articles lately uh, about the inc inc like dramatic increase in private aviation as a result of the pandemic, right? People not comfortable flying United to exactly. whatever LA or whatever they're going uh, are in, if they can afford it. And if they can, so this is bringing the cost of private aviation down dramatically to, yeah. to, to people. Uh, and, the, and, so, and, the, and the joy of the experience too, right? Uh, even if you fly charter today, you'll find it to be a rather banal experience, a pretty khaki experience, I'd say. Um, <laughs> you know, 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, it's amazing to me that how, for how much it costs to fly a private jet charter, like sort of how unluxurious it is in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, using the right aircraft that are in the market today that are super, they, they are the superlative efficiency in their categories. You know, that's the major jump. And then using software to smooth out the curves is another major increment in being able to bring that price to, to more and more people. And really, most importantly, access. Like, they're really, I, I challenge you to go try to order a charter flight right now in your phone and transact for it. Probably can't do it. Huge hassle. Um, huge barriers to entry to join any of the programs that have it on, on, you know, on apps at all. Um, you have to pay to get in to begin with. Uh, so we'll, we'll be offering an app in the app store that you can download and then you could transact right there for your first flight. That's, that's so cool. You know, so, so we can't get the app yet. Is that right? Like not I yet. couldn't no. load it yet. Okay. Not yet. No, we're working with a very small group of beta travelers that we broker flights to, and we also work on building the right uh, software experience for them. And, and we're working the basically the the big data, big data machine learning AI backend that it yeah. takes to actually um, connect these geographically distributed assets in space. Uh, it's both you know aircraft and qualified senior captains that are able to fly those aircraft to our operational controls and trust. Um, so in other words, this isn't just any aircraft, any pilot, you know, getting put together on the internet, which, you know, Silicon Valley would like, has tried to go after that model. I'll say a couple times, uh, we feel the full responsibility of the whole T and we're building an, an air service first and connecting it with software. That's really cool. And I, I can't wait to check it out. So connect air will be, is the name of the company will coming to an app store near you at some point in the future. Yeah, and you can join the community right now. One of the big sort of lessons learned from the very, you know, like I say, go watch HBO Silicon Valley if you want to understand the sort of cliches and satire that I got to live in the VC-backed yeah, you know, tech yeah. startup world. Um, you know, we one thing that was provided for in the Jobs Act of, I believe, 2017 uh, is the idea of to crowdfund equity. And so that wasn't ever available to me with Skyward that you could actually do a Kickstarter like campaign for up to a million dollars of the, you know, the early equity or even later equity in your company. Um, And so I looked at that and we took some time to make the decision and and really look at it. Um, But these FINRA accredited uh, crowdfunding platforms. Now we, we chose to go with WeFunder who I think is best in class and have a good relationship with the CEO, Nick there. Um, and it's a magnificent platform. I mean, basically allows us to offer to the public the first million dollars of equity in this, you know, tech startup, personal air mobility service. And, um, and what we're using it as we call it our community round. We're basically, we our, our very first investors are the very people we plan to fly. Right. And That's they're, so they're so, inve- they're so invested in the concept that they literally are buying equity in it from the outset and they're voting with their money that they wanted. And it has this very altruistic sort of flywheel um, growing and, and the, the team morale growing. Like it's so the opposite spin. I remember of sort of my first walking down Sand Hill road and getting kicked in whatever you want to say politely, you know, in the chin many times <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. and, you know, and kind of coming back to the team and being like, don't worry though, we'll get there. Like the morale cycle there was a downward cycle every time you got told no and we got told no you get told no you know 95 percent of the time you know Mm. and it's but here in a community building way it's more it's sort of like a marketing campaign and people are being like yes 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 and we want to be part of that community and so anybody that's listening out here i'd encourage you to go to wefunder.com slash connect air and you'll get a very comprehensive profile on the company there like we would provide to any sophisticated investor or vc and, um, and yeah, you have the ability to, to get a slice of the future of aviation. That's so cool. Well, we'll put that into the show notes. Again, it's wefunder.com slash connect air. Yeah. Uh, are, are you a LinkedIn guy? Like if people wanted to reach out and connect with you, is there any other social platform that you accept invitations to or anything else? Or, or is the wefunder the best, uh, the best URL at this point people to? Yeah. LinkedIn's great. I, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people on there now I, I, <laughs> that I don't necessarily know. So <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> another, a place to connect. another spot. Yeah, and uh, and Twitter. I'm um, at JWCE21. And I tend to lurk and read there more every day than write. Uh, but uh, now and then, if there's something interesting about Connect Air, I'll tweet. 
I'll tweet something that I hope isn't terribly bombastic since that seems to be <laughs> the order of the day. <laughs> yeah. You got to watch Twitter, man. Well, listen, yeah. I can't tell you, I can't thank you enough for doing this, uh, especially from your yurt in the middle of nowhere. I think it's awesome. Uh, Solar powered Wi Fi, globally connected off the grid. Love it, yeah. man. That's awesome. All you need is like, what is that? Is it a Rivian, the, uh, the electric powered car that has the, the thing and the truck on the top? Do you have a Rivian yet? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. But I, I'm going to, I think. Now it's on order. <laughs> I'm going to take a picture of us here in the yurt. Oh, so awesome. My team can see it. See you, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, listen, man, it was great to do this. I, I wish you all the success with Connect Air. And uh, I know you've uh, helped a lot of people in our, our conversations today. So thanks for doing it. Oh, thank you, John. Thanks for reaching out. This is a real honor to, to and, and really, you, you have a very insightful way, I have to say. Uh, it was an enjoyable conversation. Uh, you're very kind. All right, man. We'll see you again. Take care. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com slash built to sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. Thanks for listening.